Oh, hi. You caught me going to the bus. Speaking of these buses, let me school you on how cool George Perez is. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. The subject of today's video, George Perez, is very prolific. It would literally be impossible to cover every single thing that he's done and do it justice within the time constraints of the show that I produce. So instead, I wanted to take a look at this very engaging and exciting artist and focus on what he's arguably best known for, drawing team books, and stories with large casts of characters. We're going to take a look at the highlights and the stumbles of George Perez's career, try to take a look at what makes his storytelling unique, and see how some of his artwork has evolved over his career, and just generally take a look at where he's helped elevate storytelling within superhero comics. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. We're going to talk about George Perez. George Perez knew from a young age that he wanted to be an artist. Born in 1954 in the South Bronx, New York, Perez became an assistant, while still a teenager, to artist Rich Buckler. Within a year, he broke into the industry, penciling a two-page story for Marvel in Astonishing Tales No. 25 on the character Deathlock, who Buckler had co-created. Perez soon began penciling the Sons of the Tiger feature from the black and white magazine Deadly Hands of Kung Fu. In those pages, he co-created the character of the White Tiger, the first superhero of Hispanic descent and a Puerto Rican like Perez's family. Perez soon earned his big break, penciling the Avengers, beginning with issue 141 in 1975. Barring the occasional fill-in issue, he continued as the main artist on the title through issue 202 in September of 1980. While his early work on the title can look a bit simple, within two years, you can see the progress he's made when we place similar splash pages side by side. There is a turning point about three years into his run when Jim Shooter became the writer. Perez has said that he was now the established creator on the title and was allowed more freedom with the pacing and the plotting. Working on the Avengers proved that Perez could handle a title with a large cast. He displayed more and more aptitude for establishing shots so that the reader could know where everyone was, and a good range of details to help differentiate characters from one another, from body type to hairstyles. Perez worked on some notable stories during this time, like the Korvac Saga, which introduced the original Guardians of the Galaxy to the modern day, as they are from the future. That story featured almost every Avenger character up to that point. Perez also redesigned Wonder Man, twice. The first one is so crazy, it almost works. The second version, with a red safari jacket and turtleneck, may seem odd for characters that usually ran around in tights, but it was well received, and helped show off a talent for modern character design that would serve him well in his career. Perez co-created two important characters on the Avengers, the slimy government liaison Henry Gyrich and the capable mercenary Taskmaster. That character shows a complex, asymmetrical design. There are also infamous stories like Avengers 200, where Ms. Marvel becomes pregnant and immediately gives birth to a baby who rapidly ages. Then they fall in love and leave with the Avengers' blessing. I've made an episode about that issue and how that involved many writers, none of whom want to take credit for the issue. But it is probably still remembered because Perez made it look good, which then provides a further contrast to how bad the story was. It's worth noting that back in the 70s, working on the Avengers was not highly sought after by artists. Generally, Team Books was perceived as doing more work, drawing more characters, and not getting paid extra for all that effort. You got paid the same as drawing Spider-Man as you would for the Avengers, more or less. So, 
Perez took that as a personal challenge and really helped use that opportunity to make his name. And on top of that, he was not only doing just Avengers, he would sometimes do other books too, fill-in issues and runs on books like The Fantastic Four and Logan's Run at the same time. And then, towards the end of his run on Avengers, he began working for both Marvel and DC simultaneously. In 1980, George Perez began drawing Avengers for Marvel and Justice League of America for competitor DC Comics at the same time. Perez had proven himself reliable and talented. Perez's influences worked equally well at both DC and Marvel. He has claimed that his biggest influences were Kurt Swan at DC because of his ability to show Superman as an everyman and convey good expressions, and also Jack Kirby at Marvel for his dynamic action. And right before he broke in, Perez was also inspired by Neil Adams' knack for more realistic artwork. Adams had become so popular, he became the first artist to work at both Marvel and DC at the same time without using a pseudonym. Perez was wooed to work at DC by Marv Wolfman and Len Wein, who he'd gotten to know well at Marvel and who had recently moved to DC. DC offered Perez the opportunity to draw The New Teen Titans, a new book written by Wolfman. Perez agreed to it with the proviso that DC give him an opportunity to work on Justice League of America when it opened up. Sadly, longtime artist Dick Dillon passed away at this point in time, and thus, Perez was drawing Justice League and Teen Titans at the same time as Avengers. It only overlapped briefly, as Perez quickly realized he could not do all three monthly titles at once, and he let Avengers go since he'd already had a long run on it. DC expected Justice League to be the popular project, but New Teen Titans surprised everyone and became a breakout hit. The book took the old concept of popular sidekicks like Robin, Wonder Girl, and Speedy teaming up and injected new blood. Wolfman and Perez co-created new cast members like the alien Starfire, supernatural empath Raven, and the half-man, half-machine Cyborg. A team of outcast teenagers resonated with readers, and soon, Teen Titans was competing with X-Men for the most popular book on the shelves at the time. Perez cemented his reputation as a young superstar artist. George Perez soon found that he was much more passionate about the new Teen Titans book and began working on just that title. The creators introduced villain Deathstroke, a recurring adversary. Robin came up with his own new identity, Nightwing, complete with a redesigned outfit. In the popular storyline The Judas Contract, a new super teen named Terra infiltrates the team and betrays them to Deathstroke. Other innovative stories included A Day in the Lives, which showed us what happened with the characters when they weren't out saving the world, and We Are Gathered Here Today, where Wonder Girl gets married. From 1980 through 1985, George Perez was working on the Teen Titans, and in the middle there, he almost worked on a project for both Marvel and DC. In 1981, Marvel and DC had teamed up to release both a Superman, Spider-Man story and a Batman Hulk book. They did well. The following year, 1982, they had New Teen Titans X-Men. Amazing story. Fantastic. The plan was for, in 1983, to have George Perez illustrate a Justice League of America Avengers team-up book. Sadly, that project ended in disaster. The reason George Perez did not illustrate the X-Men Teen Titans book was so that he could work on Justice League of America and Avengers. Editor Dick Giordano guided things for DC, and Jim Shooter did the same for Marvel. Writer Jerry Conway came up with the plot and explained it in Back Issue Magazine, Issue 1. It would involve Kang the Conqueror and the Lord of Time, villains from Marvel and DC respectively, manipulating their respective universe's heroes into battles in an attempt to get a powerful stone that was going backwards through time. The story would have evenly matched battles like Superman and Thor, Flash and Quicksilver, Green Arrow and Hawkeye, Batman and Captain America, and many more. The October 1984 issue of Marvel Age, issue 19, 
breaks down the behind-the-scenes story from Marvel's point of view. It begins with Jim Shooter rejecting the plot, saying there are too many problems to move forward yet. However, Dick Giordano was under the impression the problems could be ironed out with dialogue and assigned Perez to start working. Perez had drawn 21 pages by the time Shooter learned of this and shut it down. There was back and forth, but ultimately, Shooter would not approve the plot. Marvel Age 19 published an edited version of Dick Giordano's letter to Shooter in response. Giordano replied to the Marvel Age issue with more parts from his letter in DC's Meanwhile column from January of 1985. Putting them together, we can get the full response where Giordano is trying to move the project forward. So, Let's bring in some guests to bring a bit of theater to their back and forth. Giordano wrote, The contract stipulates, for example, that each company should appoint a staff editor to each project. In this case, the editors so appointed were Len Wein, DC, and Mark Grunwald, Marvel. When the plot was delivered, you decided to become personally involved, counter to our previous team-up experiences, and forced my involvement at a hands-on editorial level. You had some problems with the plot. The motivation for the events was weak. I agreed with you, and we set about to fix the plot. When we thought we had it debugged, Len called you with an outline of the changes, to which you responded positively, saying you felt the changes would work. Len reported that conversation to me with a request from you that a new written plot be submitted. I thought this request to be logical, but largely a formality, and ordered George Perez to start drawing before the new plot was typed. In doing so, I had no intention of ignoring your wishes. I understand your conversation with Len to be a tacit approval of our modifications and desired only to keep the project moving. I have since apologized to you for this seeming breach of protocol and trust that this unintentional mistake is not one of the reasons for your rejection. Yes, there still remain some questions left unanswered in the plot, but no more or less than are left unanswered in most plots. More often than not, these questions are resolved while the work is in progress, and I'm sure that you'll agree the levels of skill possessed by George Perez, Roy Thomas, Len Wein, and myself are sufficient to resolve those plot holes to everyone's satisfaction, and I would surely submit the material in its subsequent, more finished stages and welcome your input at that time. Incidentally, I'm sure that you recognize the difficulty in producing a script that is truly wonderful given the extreme limitations inherent in a team-up venture of this kind. Everything and everyone must be left just as we found them, and all events and actions must end in a tie. There were plot weaknesses in Chris's X-Men Teen Titans last year, but everyone who bought the book, all those people, seemed not to care. I didn't. Finally, at a more practical level, if you insist on starting all over, we will have to name a new creative team, as previous commitments will force the withdrawal of all the team members. Further, I must then insist that you supply a detailed, written list of changes requested. The storyline makes sense to me and everyone else here, and our contract stipulates that Marvel and DC shall jointly agree on mutually acceptable modifications, and I can hardly agree with your modifications if I don't know what they are. Perhaps we should just put this back in the hands of Mark and Len and George and Roy and trust that these seasoned pros, three of whom have worked well for both companies, won't embarrass them themselves or DC and Marvel. Whichever way you choose to go, I respectfully request that you respond as quickly as possible. Time's a-wastin'. And Jim Shooter replied, saying, These are the problems with the latest version of the Avengers slash JLA plot. Ant-Man should not be included. He isn't an Avenger and would not be involved. Quicksilver must come from Adelan, where he lives, which is on the moon. Thor's hammer cannot follow a trail through time. He lost all such abilities a while back. Hawkeye is married now, a fact which should be mentioned in the scene with Black Canary. Vision has demonstrated emotions. He should not be affected by the Shiva egg because he is non-biological, not non-emotional. A Quicksilver Flash race is ludicrous since Flash can run at the speed of light and Quicksilver can't even manage the speed of sound. Perhaps Flash should race Captain Marvel who can attain the speed of light in her energy form. 
Quicksilver would also be unable to help Flash energize the makeshift cosmic treadmill in any physical way. Firestorm and Captain Marvel are probably not evenly matched, as mentioned since Firestorm controls nuclear energy, and Captain Marvel can become any energy, including nuclear. There are other small glitches, but they can be covered in dialogue. They don't affect the pictures. Presuming that you correct these minor problems, the only thing remaining to be settled before the plot is given to an artist is the selection of the artist. Don Heck, who you said was under consideration, is alright with us. If he's the man you want, go ahead and start. If you wish to propose someone else, we'll be glad to listen. These letters and others had been going back and forth with the editors in May, and Giordano passed a new plot to Shooter that Roy Thomas had written in July. But Shooter didn't respond to that until September. With all the delays, Perez became frustrated and removed himself from the project, which effectively killed it. Perez spoke with a British fanzine called Chain Reaction at that time, and he said he believes Jim Shooter wanted Perez off the book for some reason. In the Marvel Age article, Shooter acknowledges that he would be okay with artist Don Heck making the book, but Heck was not a fan favorite, and it does seem like an unrealistic choice for such a big project. Sadly, all that remains are some scans of Perez's pencils, and the book was abandoned. In an interview with Sketch Magazine in 2001, Perez explains how he felt at this time, saying, quote, Due to the political pissing contest that... Uh... Due to the political pissing contest that that brought, I had a particular grudge with the editorship at Marvel, and decided that, in my mind, whether I was right or wrong is now irrelevant, the editorship at Marvel helped kill the project, and I felt that I didn't want to work there anymore. I just didn't feel confident in the editorial judgment over at Marvel at that time. I would sign an exclusive contract with DC within a couple of months, and thus became a DC artist exclusively for five years. In 1985, Perez began illustrating DC's epic 12-issue maxi-series Crisis on Infinite Earths, again with Marv Wolfman as the writer. This was an ambitious project on a scale DC had never really attempted before. It was the story of a cosmic being known as the Anti-Monitor who was destroying entire parallel universes. The book allowed DC to give their stories a soft reboot with a revised continuity. Functionally, it allowed them to later simplify the backstories of characters like Superman. Crisis rolled in superheroes DC had purchased, but had not introduced into their books yet, like the Charlton superheroes Blue Beetle and Peacemaker. It allowed them to move Captain Marvel into a single shared world. The story featured hundreds and hundreds of DC characters, and Perez illustrated them all. This was beyond a team book, and required Perez to draw dozens of scenes featuring dozens of characters. He had to pay close attention to staging, detail, and emotion as the story featured big moments like the deaths of both Supergirl and the original Flash, Barry Allen. I'd argue it still holds up as an over-the-top action story that features every character DC had, from the Teen Titans to World War II characters like Sergeant Rock, The Losers, and The Haunted Tank. Crisis on Infinite Earths was a massive undertaking, and understandably, Perez quickly gave up Teen Titans and focused exclusively on the 12-issue series. The amount of detail on display is mind-boggling, with scenes of devastated cities, harsh weather, sci-fi equipment, and characters with many different body types, ages, backgrounds, and dispositions. One thing I find especially fun about looking at Crisis on Infinite Earths is that there are different inkers assigned to different issues, so it's really fun to compare how different artists interpret George Perez's pencils. They're always top-tier guys, like Jerry Ordway or even Dick Giordano himself. It's just a fun way to look at that. And at this point in time, Perez was starting to learn how to ink his own work. He started doing the Crisis covers. He was doing a few Teen Titans pages. He was really evolving, and he continued to flourish at DC Comics. Following Crisis, popular creators like 
John Byrne reimagined Superman, and Frank Miller reimagined Batman, Perez opted to update Wonder Woman. He co-plotted a revised version of Wonder Woman that focused more on the character's ties to Greek mythology. It's a gorgeous looking book with a new origin for the Amazons. They were created by Artemis, goddess of the hunt, with the help of other Greek gods. The queen of the Amazons, Hippolyta, is unfulfilled and crafts a baby out of clay, begging the gods to grant her a child, which they do. That's Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman's main enemy becomes the god of war, Ares. Perez illustrated the story for the first 24 issues, writing with the help of Greg Potter for the first two issues and Len Wein until issue 17, and even after leaving as an artist, Perez remained as the writer through issue 62 in 1992. I'm proud to own an original page of art from this era, featuring Darkseid. I have fond memories of this era because my sister began buying Wonder Woman starting with issue one, and I would sometimes read that, and it was just a time that we were able to connect on comics, so I have a lot of fond memories about George Perez's run on Wonder Woman. Anyway, at this point, it was 1992, Perez was past his five-year exclusive deal with DC, and he wanted to do something big with Marvel. Marvel had plans to do a big cosmic story, sort of on the same scale as Crisis on Infinite Earths. It didn't go quite as smoothly. In 1991, Perez began to get frustrated with DC over editorial decisions on Wonder Woman. He thought DC should do more to celebrate Wonder Woman's 50th anniversary. Instead, they asked for edits to his miniseries War of the Gods, and they handed over the writing duties on Wonder Woman to William Messner Loeb's, including a wedding that Perez had been building up to between Etta Candy and Steve Trevor. Concurrent with this, he accepted Marvel's offer to illustrate a six-issue miniseries, which would come to be called Infinity Gauntlet. It was written by Jim Starlin, who had spent a year building up to this story in the pages of Silver Surfer and a two-issue series called Thanos Quest, where the alien villain Thanos gathered six gems, which allowed him to control all of reality. The story featured Thanos eliminating half of all sentient life in an attempt to win the love of the literal embodiment of death. This was, again, an epic story along the lines of Crisis, and it featured nearly every Marvel superhero at the time. And again, Perez proved to do an exceptional job showing a massive and diverse cast and making them all stand apart from one another. The story featured alternately epic scenes with massive two-page spreads and splash pages of huge fights alongside quieter scenes of, say, Thanos arguing his case to death to win her love. Unfortunately, his duties with DC meant he became overwhelmed. After penciling only a few pages of issue four, Perez had to step down and Marvel placed Ron Lim on the book to wrap things up. Nevertheless, Perez's attention to detail and gorgeous layouts proved that he was still at the top of his game. He filled in on some issues for various publishers and did a little creator-owned work, but he made his next big impact in 1997. Marvel had tried an experiment on their titles in 1996, handing over their books to superstars Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee. But in 1997, it was time to bring things back to basics. Perez was hired to illustrate The Avengers with Kurt Busiek writing. The creative team stayed in place for nearly three years, and this is a critically acclaimed run, for good reason. There are epic stories against major villains like Ultron, who decimates an entire small European country. And the book kicked off, featuring almost every Avenger up to that point. Perez had something to prove that he was still one of the best artists working. He loaded his pages with detail and made sure characters were given unique looks and designs. He played into the Romani history of Scarlet Witch, for example. One decision I never loved was how he gave Thor a button nose, but at least he was a blonde guy that didn't look like Captain America when they had masks off. George Perez and Kurt Busiek delivered a fantastic, beautiful run on the Avengers. It wasn't perfect. There were some dud characters like triathlon, but overall, it's a wonderful, wonderful run. I loved it at the time that it was coming out. It's since received tons of critical acclaim for very good reason. It looked 
beautiful. And it was so well received that it earned that creative team an opportunity. George Perez would get a second chance. Finally, Marvel and DC were going to do Justice League of America Avengers. JLA Avengers came out in 2004 as a four-issue prestige series. Cosmic beings from both the Marvel and DC universes form a contest between each universe's mightiest heroes. There are 12 contests to win objects of power from each universe. Things like the Spear of Destiny, Green Lantern Power Battery, Cosmic Cube, and Infinity Gauntlet. There are twists and turns regarding which side will win, with Captain America intentionally forcing a loss as a way to sacrifice themselves to save their universe. But instead, the two universes are merged, and the heroes get to team up against the villains. This story gives you everything you'd want, each of the similarly powered heroes fighting one another, as well as ultimately teaming up. There's something very cool about seeing Superman going into battle with Captain America's shield and Thor's hammer. It isn't exceptionally deep, but it's very entertaining. And Perez's artwork is some of his best, not just for the designs or the detail, but the storytelling itself. Several critics have noted that Perez paced out the fights expertly by utilizing a mixture of big panels for powerful moments combined with smaller panels focused on individual moves. I'd argue that it's very reminiscent of a lot of manga, which will pace fight scenes in a similar manner. Perez is in total control of his audience, and the cherry on top had to be the double-length cover for issue 3 featuring every member of any Avengers or Justice League team in one epic poster. The elements of Perez's techniques that I most appreciate are varied. I think his design sense is incredible, with characters like Deathstroke and Scarlet Witch being towards the top of my personal list. I also like his Wonder Man in the red safari jacket. I appreciate his storytelling skills, as I just spoke about. His pacing puts him in control of the story in a way few others can compete with, and his art acts as a fulcrum point between the Silver Age and modern age artwork. For instance, he adopts techniques from Kurt Swan and Jack Kirby, but also some of the realism and surrealism by, respectively, Neil Adams and Jim Steranko that were paving the way for the Bronze Age. But I would argue Perez always erred slightly towards the more classic techniques, and he found a way that made it work for him. It's like he always had something to prove, and so he would take on big, big projects and then he would knock it out of the park. He was constantly, throughout his career, proving himself, even when he really didn't have anything to prove. He never slowed down, is what I'm saying. You know, he never started becoming a lesser artist. He just continued to evolve, become more detailed, become better at pacing, become better at inking. It's a really impressive career to scrutinize. Um, and while Perez definitely took more assignments after that 2004 JLA Avengers, he did start slowing down in the 2010s, and he announced his retirement from comics in 2019 due to failing eyesight. That said, beyond being a talented artist, Perez is beloved by... I would say almost all of his peers, and certainly by the fans. When he goes to conventions, he goes out of his way to do commissions, he poses for really fun photos, he's always wearing bright uh, shirts that his wife has designed. He just is a, a friendly, fun guy that also produces incredible work. In my opinion, George Perez is one of the best that mainstream comics has ever had to offer us. Thank you so much for watching this episode, and I want to give an especial big thanks to both Hooded Cobra Commander 788 and Godzilla Mendoza. They voiced a portion of those letters that we read in the middle. Thank you both. The links for their shows are in the description below. I will be back next week, and I also want to give a thanks, a big thanks, to my patrons. Honestly, I could not do this show without your support. For as little as a dollar, you can help support this show. Again, there are links at the end of this show and in the description below.
But that's plenty from me. I'm going to have more for you next week. And until then, I want you to keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.